A sun on wand in knoll of sand she showed, clad in her cramoisy hued chemisette. Of her lips honey dew she gave me drink, and with her rosy cheeks quencheth fire she set. Then they attired Dunyazad in a dress of blue brocade, and she became as she were the full moon when it shineth forth. So they displayed her in this for the first dress, before King Shazaman, who rejoiced in her and well nigh swooned away for love longing and amorous desire, Yea, he was distraught with passion for her, when as he saw her, because she was as saith of her, one of her describers in these couplets, she comes apparelled in an azure vest, ultramarine as skies are decked and dight. I viewed the unparalleled sight which showed my eyes, a summer moon, upon a winter night. Then they returned to Sherazad and displayed her in the second dress, a suit of surpassing goodliness, and veiled her face with her hair like a chin veil. Moreover, they let down her side locks, and she was even as saith of her, one of her describers in these couplets, O hail to him whose locks his cheeks o'ershade, Who slew my life by cruel hard despite. Said I, hast veiled the morn in night? He said, nay, I but veiled the moon in hue of night. Then they displayed Dunyazad in a second and a third and a fourth dress, and she paced forward like the rising sun, and swayed to and fro in the insolence of her beauty, and she was, even as saith the poet of her, in these couplets. The sun of beauty she to all appears, and lovely coy she mocks all loveliness, and when he fronts her favor and her smile, a morn the sun of day in clouds must dress. Then they displayed Scheherazade in the third dress, and the fourth, and the fifth, and she became as she were a band branch snell of a thirsting gazelle, lovely of face, and perfect in attributes of grace, even as saith of her, one in these couplets. She comes like fullest moon on happy night, tapper of waste with shape of magic might. She hath an eye whose glances quell mankind, and ruby on her cheeks reflect his light, and veils her hips the blackness of her hair. Beware of curls that bite with viper bite. Her sides are silken soft, what while the heart, mere rock behind that surface, scapes our sight. From the fringed curtains of her sign she shoots, shafts that at furthest range on mark a light. Then they returned to Dunyazad and displayed her in the fifth dress and in the sixth, which was green, when she surpassed with her loveliness the fair of the four quarters of the world, and outvied with the brightness of her countenance the full moon at rising tide, for she was even as saith of her the poet in these couplets. A damsel twas the tyrer's art, had decked with snare and slight, and robed with rays as though the sun from her had borrowed light. She came before us wondrous clad in chemisette of green, as veiled by his leafy screen pomegranate hides from sight, and when he said, 
How callest thou the fashion of thy dress? She answered us in pleasant way, with double meaning dight. We call this garment creve coeur, and rightly it is height. For many a heart with this we break, and harried many a sprite. Then they displayed Scheherazade in the sixth and the seventh dresses, and clad her in youth's clothing. Whereupon she came forward, swaying from side to side, and coquettishly moving, and indeed she ravished wits and hearts, and ensorcelled all eyes with her glances. She shook her sides and swayed her haunches, then put her hair on sword hilt and went up to King Shehrear, who embraced her as hospitable host embraceth guest, and threatened her in her ear with the taking of the sword, and she was even as saith of her the poet in these words, Were not the murk of gender male, than feminine surpassing fair, tire woman, they had grudged the bride, who made her beard and whiskers wear. Thus also they did with her sister Dunyazad, and when they had made an end of the display, the king bestowed robes of honor on all who were present and sent the brides to their own apartments. Then Shahrazad went in to the king Shahriar, and Dunyazad to king Shah Zaman, and each of them solaced himself with the company of his beloved consort, and the hearts of the folk were comforted. When morning morrowed, the wazir came in to the two kings, and kissed ground before them, wherefore they thanked him, and were large of bounty to him. Presently they went forth and sat down upon couches of kingship, whilst all the wazirs and emirs and grandees and lords of the land presented themselves and kissed ground. King Shehrayar ordered them dresses of honor and largesse, and they prayed for the permanence and prosperity of the king and his brother. Then the two sovereigns appointed their sire-in-law, the wazir, to be viceroy in Samarkand, and assign him five of the chief emirs to accompany him, charging them attend him and do him service. The minister kissed ground and prayed that they might be vouchsafed length of life. Then he went into his daughters, whilst the eunuchs and ushers walked before him and saluted them and farewelled them. They kissed his hands and gave him joy of the kingship and bestowed on him immense treasure, after which he took leave of them and setting out fared days and nights till he came near Samarkand, where the townspeople met him at a distance of three marches and rejoiced in him with exceeding joy. So he entered the city and they decorated the houses and it was a notable day. He sat down on the throne of his kingship, and the wazirs did him homage, and the grandees and emirs of Samarkand, and all prayed that he might be vouchsafed justice and victory and length of continuance. So he bestowed on them robes of honor and entreated them with distinction, and they made him sultan over them. As soon as his father-in-law had departed for Samarkand, King Shehriar summoned the grandees of his realm and made them a stupendous banquet of all manner of delicious meats and exquisite sweetmeats. He also bestowed on them robes of honor and gordoned them and divided the kingdoms between himself and his brother in their presence, whereat the folk rejoiced. Then the two kings abode, each ruling a day in turn, and they were ever in harmony with each other. 
while on similar wise their wives continued in the love of Allah Almighty and in thanksgiving to Him, and the peoples and the provinces were at peace, and the preachers prayed for them from the pulpits, and their report was brooded abroad, and the travelers bore tidings of them to all lands. In due time, King Shehrear summoned chronicles and copyist and bade them write all that had betided him with his wife first and last so they wrote this and named it the stories of the thousand nights and a night the book came to thirty volumes and these the king laid up in his treasure, and the two brothers abode with their wives in all pleasance and solace of life and its delights, for that indeed Allah the Most High had changed their annoy into joy, and on this wise they continued till there took them the destroyer of delights, the severer of societies, the desolator of dwelling places, and garnerer of graveyards, and they were translated to the ruth of Almighty Allah. Their houses fell waste, and their palaces lay in ruins, and the kings inherited their riches. Then there reigned after them a wise ruler who was just, keen-witted, and accomplished, and loved tales and legends, especially those which chronicle the doings of sovereigns and sultans, and he found in the treasury these marvelous stories and wondrous histories contained in the thirty volumes aforesaid. So he read in them a first book, and a second, and a third, and so on to the last of them, and each book astounded and delighted him more than that which preceded it, till he came to the end of them. Then he admired what he had read therein of description and discourse, and rare traits and anecdotes, and moral instances and reminiscences, and bade the folk copy them and dispread them over all lands and climes, wherefore their report was brooded abroad, and the people named them the marvels and wonders of the thousand nights and a night. This is all that hath come down to us of the origin of this book, and Allah is all-knowing, so glory be to him who the shifts of time waste not away, nor doth aught of chance or change affect his sway, whom one case diverteth not from other case, and who is soul in the attributes of perfect grace, and prayer and the peace be upon the Lord's pontiff and chosen one among his creatures, our Lord, Muhammad, the prince of mankind through whom we supplicate him for a goodly and godly end. End of section 24. Recording by Salim Siddiqui. www.hotconflict.com